uh, start some conversation uh, and to include the audience in this process. What am I doing? I think it's. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask each of you a question and then we'll turn to the audience. Um, so, in your in the layout of the book, I found a wonderful way to organize the story. Um, to have the Okada articles in there and, and then have yourself and scholars making their commentary different angles to come in uh, with. And also, um, uh, Frank, with you, to have uh, segments of the interviews that you did with people laid, uh, uh, kind of interlaced in your uh, uh, presentation worked really well. I, I felt like it um, introduced different perspectives at the same time uh, as it allowed you to continue your thread the way you were thinking. So can you talk a little bit about how you uh, decided to format that story? It's funny you mentioned that, Satsuki, because in my background, is a read. they're basically, in radio news terms, I'm a radio news journalist, they're sound bites. The little actualities that when you see a TV news story on TV, you see a, an anchor man reading something, and then there'll be a someone, oh yeah, a fire was this high, and the flames were that, you know. Uh, that's the same thing as a, a soundbite. And I just I had these interviews that shot for a, a film that never quite finished. Um, uh, th that uh, I wanted to, I, I dropped them in like, like soundbites. And that's kind of how I think. Is, is how you, you take these voices of people and you write around them. And, and, and use them and, and help you know uh, uh, provide the context for these little quotes, these little, little snippets. And so it helped me to organize my thoughts in, in writing the book. And, and it, it kind of it stayed there, stayed that way. But but it helps to advance the, the narrative at the same time as it allows the, their personalities to breathe. And you understand you know who they were, how they viewed John, you know what times were like for them, uh, just from, from their actual words. But thanks for picking up on yeah, that. Yeah, and particularly um, hearing actual words from Dorothy Okada, her, her perspective uh, about John and his work. Dorothy Okada, uh, has passed, the late Dorothy Okada was John's Kibe wife, Kibe Nisei wife from Hawaii, daughter of a, a minister, a Christian minister. Do Dorothy was an unusual woman. She uh, was unlike most other Nisei women I've ever met. Uh, and uh, if you listen to the interview that she did with Frank Chin and Sean Wong uh, shortly after John passed, they went to famously drill down to Pasadena to interview her, and she revealed to them that you know she had burned, famously burned the second manuscript that John was working on uh, on the Issei. Um, you, you, you get the picture of someone who is different. She's <laughs> very, very different. That's all I, all I can say is that she's had a mind of her own. Uh, she she um, she did she, she didn't agree with John about a lot of things. It's a it's a wonder to me how what you know what he saw in her, quite frankly, or what, what, she, saw, <laughs> <laughs> or what she saw in him. You know, uh, uh, and, and, and there's this funny story in the book about how they met, and you can read that, and you get you know, a feeling for for who she is. Um, but um, she was a character. That's I, I, all I can say. She was, she was, she was a character. But it also reflects on John. Uh, in some ways, too, to hear the voices from uh, family members, teachers, people who knew him, co-workers. So I thought uh, that that way of laying it out really gave it a, a tremendous amount of rich, layered uh, interpretation. So I thought that was really well done. And Greg, um, I, th I thought that it would be really helpful, maybe you could elaborate more on um, what was going on with the community that the book didn't take off? You wrote, you, you gave a great kind of uh, uh, theoretical, but also uh, a different way of looking at why that book didn't sell. Right, well, uh, I, mean, I speak about this at greater length in my essay, but the reason that my essay is called A Seed in a Devastated Landscape is that Okada's is the first flowering of literature after the war. What you have to understand is that before World War II, with the possible exception of the Jews, the Japanese Americans were the most literate ethnic group. Uh, the, their parents, particularly the mothers, were almost 100% literate in, in Japanese. 
and had encouraged their children to become educated. We'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. But the point being that the Nisei were disproportionately educated and they were entranced with American literature. And throughout the 1930s, there were Nisei newspapers like the Nichibei and the Kashimai Nichi and the Raku Shimpo. They all had Sunday literature sections. And then there were magazines such as Yasuo Sasaki's Reimei and Eddie Shimano's Gyosho and Jimmy Omura's Current Life, which published literature by Nisei. How good it was is beside the point. Um, it was mixed, actually. But the point is that they wrote by, it was written, literature written by and for each other. Yeah. And the war wipes that out. The camps experience the trauma of removal. Um, the need to survive afterwards um, reduces the literary output of that generation at the same time that it um, reduces the kind of community spirit. So even though a lot of these newspapers are reborn after World War II, Rafu Shimpo, or new ones start, like in San Francisco, there is the Progressive News, and then there is the uh, Bilingual Hakube Mainichi. They don't have literary sections. After a little while of having sketches on resettlement, the Pacific Citizen ceases to do book reviews or to host literature. So by the time John Okada is starting to write and to publish, there are no venues for Japanese Americans to publish and be in dialogue with the community. It's not that No No Boy was necessarily um, popular, would have been popular anyway, but the point is that no book about the camps would have succeeded in 1957. There was no way that the community was able to absorb literature. I mean, for example, I, Clifford Vieta, who was later, of course, uh, a big figure in San Francisco and the president of the JACL, he published a novel in 1960 that was taken from his own experience in Alaska in the pre-war years, but had white characters. Not a single review of it in the Japanese American press. Um, and th that was as safe as it could be. It's just that both the market for literature and the attention of the community had been so fragmented uh, by the wartime experience and the post-war resettlement that, as I say, it was not that Okada was following a tradition, he was trying to restart a tradition after a psychological atomic bomb. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I saw it as that, a psychological atomic bomb, that there was this um, post-war trauma effect on the entire community. People didn't want to read or hear about their experience, and they certainly uh, were reluctant to write about it. So Okada's work uh, was like three years after he was released, right? Did he write that in 19... Oh. Yeah, it, the, the original stories come just months after he returns to the United right. States. <laughs> But so, as Frank says, only one of them has a Japanese <coughs> character, and there's no reference to the camps. Ah, right. Uh, right. So he started Dono Boy, I would say. Uh, he sketches from Dono Boy at a teacher's college in New York City in 1949, <laughs> just sketches. Yeah. Uh, but didn't really come to write the manuscript to, to Detroit, let's say 1954, 55. Right. 10 years. Yeah. So you use the word fragmented and suppressed, and. Uh, I think it was the continued legacy of the mass incarceration trauma. There were novels about the camps in the late 1940s and early 1950s, but they were all written by non-Japanese, yeah. and uh, either by Caucasians or in the case of Chester Hines, um, Ippy Hollows Let Him Go, and his short story about an incarcerated Nisei by an African American. Okay, thank you. So let's uh, see if you have any questions or comments you'd like to share. Or jokes. Yeah. And mostly a Nikkei audience, we always have to ask for the second person. No, in no. <laughs> Should I start? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the book is titled No No Boy. It has nothing to do with No No Boys. It's a story about Nisei draft resistors. Uh, can you speak to the con conflation of the terms and uh, how Nisei draft resistors themselves have yeah. liked or disliked the book? The, um, in Martha Nakagawa, in her chapter in our book, uh, takes John Okada to task for doing a disservice to the Nisei draft resistors uh, because, um, well, two things. 
Nono Boy, the book is not about Nono Boy, so it's really late. Uh, the book is about a, a draft resistor from Minidoka uh, who spent two years in camp and two years in prison. Uh, two years in prison was a sentence that the draft resistors got from Park Mountain and to like, uh, from Minidoka and, and Park Mountain. Um, the Nonos, who were from all the camps, uh, who were segregated to Tuvalu Lake, were the, the punishment was being segregated to Tuvalu Lake, to the to the prison camp that became Tuvalu Lake, uh, which later led many to renounce their U.S. citizenship. But um, Okada was in Guam overseas at the time. He wasn't, you know, with most people in camp, so he didn't know what was going on going on over here. He got it all from Jibokutsu after the war. It came out in a tumble of words. They were drunk. You know, there was a lot of music <laughs> in the bar, and Okada's taking notes. And he got, you know, he quite frankly just got mixed up, in my opinion. It conflated the two ideas, and wrote a novel called Nono Boy. And at times, at twice, each year refers to himself as a Nono Boy. But you, there's no mention of the loyalty oath in, in, in the novel. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there is mentioned quite a lot about standing for the judge and saying why he refused to go in the army, which is a draft resistance. So, um, Martha Field is the judge, I thought it a great disservice to the, to the, to the no-no boys and draft resistors. Secondly, um, um, I don't know what I thought actually. I uh, have the draft resistors themselves. Uh, Frank Emmy, uh, hate, the, the real draft resistors hate, or dislike, they hate the novel. Because when you read it, the character of Ichiro Yamada is a classic, well not a classic, but he's, he's a, a, a protagonist who's always questioning himself. He's always, he's uncertain. He, um, when, when he gets off a bus from prison in Seattle, walks down the street feeling like a stranger, a Nisei vet comes up with a soldier, uh, comes up on the sidewalk in, in uniform and says, uh, you know, where you been? Uh, no, I'm not this, that, that. Oh, in the service, how about this? No, no, no. no, no. Oh, you're in prison, huh? No, no, boy, huh? And he, and he, and he spits on, on each year old, and, and the guy says, uh, next time I'll piss on you, something like that. So, I mean, that, that's how the novel opens. Um, and, and, you know, Shimokutsu and Frank Emmy said, if they had done that to me, I would have hauled back and you know, walloped him. You know, that's <laughs> not me. That's not my story. Um, but, you know, John did not. You know, again, he, he didn't. He didn't. What's missing from the novel Nono Boy uh, is the principled resistance of the draft resistors from Minidoka and Hart Mountain. The guys who said, "I am refusing to be drafted uh, because you deny me my constitutional rights. I'm here in this prison camp for two years. If you restore my rights as a citizen, let my families go back to the West Coast to our homes. I'll be happy to serve in, in, in your army, in our army." Uh, and uh, failing that, I, 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 I'm not going. I'm not, I, this because the only, you know, by 1944, my the only uh, hook that I have to protest this, because remember we've already surrendered our rights uh, as citizens by going into these camps in the first place. You know, we, we did cooperate with eviction. We cooperate with incarceration. You know, there was no mass riot. No mass resistance. Uh, by 1944, the only thing you could do is say, I'm not going to, this is the last book I have to protest or to uh, contest this uh, unconstitutional action. Uh, that's missing from the novel. And, and all you get is each year old questioning himself, questioning whether it's his mother, who is a rabid, who, has, who harbors fantasy of, fantasies of being rescued by a boat from Japan who will take the, the Japanese back to Japan. Um, you, get, you get that in the novel. So that, that's the, the problem of the novel, which the, it, in some eyes detracts from the novel, but also it, it's the, the struggle inside this character it makes it a great literary work because it has that internal monologue, that drive to try to understand what happened to us 10 years ago, you know? How did we get into those camps? What happened to us come out? And why can't we talk to each other now that we're out? We have yes, yes, and no, no, and it's still defined. I'm, you know, I'm defined as a no, no boy now because, because of this, what I did. How did that happen? And, and in 1957, and even as late as 2000, quite frankly, 2001, um, we still couldn't understand why those things divide, divided us. And to some degree, still today, a lot of uh, uh, folks uh, uh, of a certain generation still can't let go of the fact that, oh, you were yes, yes, uh, you were no, no, and, you know, forget you. 
Uh, so um, that, that's, that, that's the, the urgency and the struggle of, of, of Ichiro's uh, internal thinking in the novel, which makes it a great novel and perhaps not so great of a movie, which so that there's never been a movie of it yet uh, that's been, uh, been attempted. But I think that uh, it's also, yes, I think everything Frank says is right. And yes, it is a fundamental error in some sense by Okaba. It also reflects this larger vision that it's Ichiro, the draft resistor, who is the Nisei everyman. That is, everybody in Seattle, whether they were veterans or draft resistors, is facing the same problem. They're coming back uh, to an America where they're still excluded they're still ghettoized, they're still discriminated against, uh, they're demoralized all, they've all lost most of their possessions, if not all, and they're shivering in these miserable places in Seattle. And so while Ichiro is an extreme version, he's uh, a symbolic of the entire community. Uh, the entire community are people who have been excluded, who have been told no, no in trying to enter the United States. It's interesting that the little bit that Dorothy Okada could remember of what her husband was going to write about the Issei dealt with them coming to Seattle and immediately getting rocks thrown at them or um, getting getting hit at. It's something different. Yeah. Okay. But the point being that he, even as a military intelligence service veteran, was able to put himself in the shoes of the draft resistor because in the final analysis, what they were facing in the post-war years was not that different. Yeah, you know, I think um, one of the after effects of a mass trauma too is a kind of a rigidifying of a person's belief about themselves. Decisions and choices they made and this kind of uh, narrowly defined who I am uh, uh, because of all the challenges. People had to make choices and decisions. And so I think for me, from a psychology point of view, uh, one of the great benefits of uh, John Okada's writing is he is somebody who took on an alter ego, separate from his own experience. And you talk about the empathy that he uh, wrote uh, in a way that wasn't just about his own experience, but really put himself in, in the opposite position. And I think post-war, that was one of the hardest things for all of us to do. That post-war, we were going to move forward, but we were gonna justify and rigidify uh, who was right and who was wrong. Uh, so he captured that uh, with the reaction to Ichigo, but in, uh, writing about Ichiro's in, internal struggles and his questions, uh, I think were, was Okada's alter ego, that he, he was really trying to understand what he might have done or what it would, like, it would have been like for him to take that position. Yes? Twice in his life, he wrote the pseudonym. The first time, he wrote the poem anonymously, and uh, you know, perhaps it was modesty, but perhaps he was trying to protect his family because it was only four days after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese attack, and if he said John Okada, there could have been somebody who would, you know, a mob might go to his family's hotel and attack them for being outspoken, perhaps. And it's not unfounded because in Seattle, not a block, from the, two blocks from their hotel. Uh, there was a murder uh, occurred in Chinatown, Seattle, in the second week of December. It was a, a Chinese tutor, I mentioned it before, uh, a, chi a Chinese man was a, confronted by some bullies, and uh, he was beaten and killed, and his, he was decapitated mm. uh, on the streets of Seattle, fifth, at Fifth and Main, right, you know, right, right by uh, wow. Fuji Sushi Restaurant. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, so the, and, and the, the Seattle newspaper called it you know, Chinatown murder mystery. And the police soon realized that it was, that it was most likely this Chinese guy was mistaken for being a Japanese uh, who had attacked Pearl Harbor or being a Japanese spy or something. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was the tenor of Seattle and no doubt here in the Bay Area too, after, immediately after the attack. There was a, just, as a, and just as much as it was after 
uh, a fear of the other, fear of those who look like the enemy. And in this case, there was actually a murder in, in Seattle that was uh, well publicized at the time. So that, that was the first example. The second example, uh, he wrote a, a, te a technical, uh, he wrote an article for a trade journal, Armed Forces Management. And it was a satire of wasteful, wasteful practices in the defense industry in the 60s, in what the, the era that Eisenhower called uh, the military industrial complex. Uh, the Cold War was in, in, in full bloom. Uh, the Russians had just launched, launched Sputnik, we're in a space race, and uh, the defense industry was booming. Okada wrote uh, uh, manuals and instruction manuals for Hughes Aircraft in Southern California. And he, when he left Hughes, he wrote this satire about wasteful practices, about, uh, about the uh, high cost of proposals, and spending thousands of dollars on beautiful packaging for bids for defense contracts from the government. And um, he could do this, under, he did it under a pseudonym, John Hillfield. Uh, and, and he did it to avoid being, um, it was after he left Hughes, it was to, to avoid being uh, uh, you know, ridiculed by his co-workers, his friends in the industry. So he, had, he disguised his identity for that reason. Uh, Hillfield in Japanese, I'm told, is another, Okada in Japanese is another name for it. Hill of Fields, a field of hills. So John Hillfield was his, his pseudonym. It was not unheard of by any means for Nisei to use pseudonyms. Uh, Mary Oyama Midwer called herself Deirdre. Leo Tajiri was um, uh, Sunisei. And, um, the, and Larry Tajiri, for example, wrote as Steve, sometimes as Steve Tamiyoshi. Sometimes it was Japanese Americans who didn't want to be too Japanese American. Like Milton Ozaki sometimes wrote under the name Saber, which is like the English version of Ozaki. Um, but I, since Okada published one of the essays under his own name yeah. and used Hillfield for the other, it's possible that he just uh, didn't want to be seen to be contributing too much. That is, um, he didn't want to sound like a one-trick pony that uh, it would be easier if it was uh, somebody else. Grace? Yeah, I had a question about the Japanese Marine Corps and What I said is that, uh, well, it's very quickly, I'll say, uh, Peter, William Peterson, in his 1966 article on Japanese American, Japanese American Success Story in the New York Times Magazine, uh, is generally quoted with inventing the concept, if not the term, model minority, uh, for discussing the Japanese Americans who have been able to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, uh, thus implicitly comparing them with African Americans or others who demand government action or society change in order to give them equality. Peterson uh, cited Nono Boy as being, and Okada as being, a positive reference, anti-rebellion. That is, it's a conservative uh, view of Nono Boy. That is, that Ichiro is a weakling and a loser because he didn't go into the army, because he didn't uh, be a veteran and defend the flag. Uh, he feels self-pitying and self-hating and because he missed the big experience. I think it's a simplistic and incorrect reading of Okada, but Okada is sufficiently large to allow for all the different kinds of readings and it's a plausible reading. I think Bill Hosokawa, who supported Nono Boy uh, and wrote what a great book it was during Okada's lifetime, also had this view that it was anti-radical that it was anti-resistant. Uh, and again, I think that's a mistaken view of it, but it is a plausible view. The, the second, that goes into the second part of my question, which is, uh, you mentioned that the Japanese Marine Corps didn't want to be too It's a tragic ending, and uh, he's walking uh, after this tragedy towards King Street Station, uh, searching, hoping, wondering, searching, uh, looking for an answer. And what was that? A glimmer of hope? Maybe that was it. A glimmer of hope far in the distance. Uh, and, and writing in 1957, or you know, 10 years after the end of World War II, Okada did not have the scripts available to him 
of, to know what would come next. Mm -hmm. So he, he could only write from where he was at in the, the desert of the 1950s. He could not foresee that you know, 20 years later, there'd be a day of remembrance in his hometown of Seattle that would kickstart the redress campaign mm -hmm. for Japanese Americans. He could not foresee the Sansei growing up, graduating, going to law school, and you know, fighting for uh, Koro Nobis, uh, for Gordon Hirabayashi and for Koromatsu. So he could not foresee these things that we, we know now uh, happen. Uh, and um, so all, all, he, all he could do was hope. Uh, and and a, a, glim, a faint glimmer of hope is, is where he could take it. But what he did do, as, as Satsuki says, was, you know, you read the novel and it's clear he understands these people, yes, yes, no, no, should not be fighting with each other. Like Greg says, I mean, we all suffered this terrible, yeah. Well, yeah, psychological, psychological blah, blah, blah. And, and, and we all wandered around Seattle kind of, you know, mad at each other. And, and, and it's, it's this kind of quarrel that leads to the central tragedy at the end of the novel, this fight between Nisei veteran and Nisei resistor. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's clear that his, 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 his novelist's omniscient view is, you know, we should not be doing this. This, this is not right. What, is ha what has happened to us? What made us this way? Will we ever find peace, our place in America? There, I see a glimmer of hope. You know, there's a glimmer of hope. And when he talks to his publisher, he says, Ichiro might have committed a, a bad act, but it pales in comparison to what the government did to us all. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay, yes, go ahead. burned everything. Uh, and uh, no, of course, he, he didn't destroy any of the works. I mean, um, he wrote a letter to his publisher, and uh, he said, I am now at work on a second which will have for its protagonist an immigrant Issei rather than, uh, rather than an Issei. When completed, I hope that it will, to some degree, faithfully describe the experiences of the immigrant Japanese in the US. This is a story which has never been told in fiction, and only in fiction can the hopes and fears and joys and sorrows of people be adequately recorded. I feel an urgency to write up a Japanese in the US for the Issei are rapidly vanishing, and I should regret it if their chapter in American history should die with them. Yeah. Um, and in the, in the book, you'll see uh, Dorothy's description of the one paragraph or the one passage mm -hmm. from the novel, but you have the book, so you need to read it. Yeah. But it does seem uh, likely that you sort of ran out of steam he did start it, and he did work on it, and then he, I think he worked on it less and less. Definitely. Although although it was very admirable that even after No No Boy did not have a big success, he was not discouraged and, immediate, and still set to work on this other novel because of the lack of appreciation what he was doing, and just the need to earn a living, and he was getting older, and uh, his health wasn't as great and such. He, he you know, uh, slowed down uh, on this other project. And so by the time he died, you know, it was something that was just probably in a drawer. Um, that is, he had not worked on it, probably not worked on it. We, we, we don't know we don't. to what degree it was finished or unfinished. Right. That's right, yeah. yeah. But, the, uh, but the thing is that you're absolutely right about his having the burden of being the only one. In some sense, that liberated him because he didn't have a community to answer to. He, he had a, a more universal mission to tell, not only to tell the community about itself, but also to tell other 
people about the, the experience of the Japanese Americans. And when he's talking to his publisher about recording the experience of the, of the Issei, that really has a resonance with what he tried to do in No No Boy to universalize the tragedy of the Nisei. One of the things that stands out to me is that I don't think it necessarily shows a model minority because of the different perspectives that are shown. In particular, I love the character of, of Frank, and I think it, it stands out as like um, a book that portrays that war is hell, and it was hell for everybody, you know, no matter if they were fighting in the 442nd or wherever, that it was really a difficult, difficult time. And I loved the character of the mom who's kind of in a very strange space thinking that she's going to be saved. And I was wondering if you could talk about those two characters a little bit. Oh, uh, with the first character, uh, you mean Kenji, the one like a veteran? Kenji, 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 okay. Uh, let me talk about the mother first. Um, if you uh, look at the book, uh, you, people, the students, uh, and, and Professor Kahar will, will back me up on this, but st students read the book uh, are confused by the, the mother character. No one could be that crazy or be like that. And in fact, the, you, uh, you look at Jim Makutsu's family, uh, Jim's mother was just like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jim, there was a, a cult, I was shocked to discover there was a cult uh, in Brazil called the, the Shindo Reine. I mean, uh, that, that was, had thousands of adherents uh, and was quite a bit of a terrorist cult uh, that believed that the Japanese had won the war, that it was so-called fake news that the U.S. had won, <laughs> and that there would be ships arriving in Japan to rescue true believers and take them back to Japan. And Jim Okutsu's mother did you know, listen to this and she believed it. And Okada was there in the shoe store with Jim, so he, he heard this stuff too. And uh, spoiler alert, oh, you read the novel already, so he, uh, Jim's mother also did herself uh, take her own life uh, as the mother did the novel. So um, it, it was, it's not that far from reality. Uh, it's, it's, it's not well known in our community that, that there were these, these adherents who uh, picked up these shortwave radio messages from Brazil and in Seattle and, and that passed on the news. There was a large number of people in uh, Issei in Hawaii who got broadcast from Japan and were convinced that when there was the picture of MacArthur, a famous picture of MacArthur and the emperor, that it was MacArthur who had gone to surrender to the emperor. Uh, <laughs> or that. Yeah, yeah. Um, as for the character of Kenji, um, we, we don't know if there's any particular uh, person that he was based on. Uh, 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 Jim Okutsu did have uh, one friend, uh, Sho, Shogo Yamaguchi, uh, Shiro Yamaguchi, who um, did lose a leg uh, in the battle of, well, one of the battles and uh, came back uh, and was a friend of Okada's. Uh, but I think the personality of Kenji, the, the kind of belief in America, and uh, the, the kind of advice he gives uh, Ichiro to get married outside the race and you forget about all this stuff, you know, th that may have simply been the author himself endowing this character mm -hmm. with some of his own, uh, not his beliefs, but Parts of you know, Okada gave part of himself to Kenji and part of himself, part of himself to Ichiro, and let the two characters play it out on the page. So it was a dialogue. It was it was Okada, the writer, having a dialogue with himself on the page with these two characters. Yeah. But even the person who goes to war doesn't come out refreshed for the winner. I mean, I think that's yeah. yeah. But it was hell. War yeah. was hell. Yeah. It was hell. Yeah. It's symbolized by his loss of his leg. Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, uh, I lived in Seattle for quite a while, although I moved there uh, much later. I, but I know that the Seattle Japanese American community was a very tight-knit community. And, you know, everybody knew everybody. And uh, I can see where Okada, who literally was not really a camp s survivor in the sense that others the rest of us right. were. Five months. Yeah, and so when he comes to Seattle after the war, I'm sure, I mean, that there were deep divisions within the community about, you know, the uh, kind of patriots <laughs> versus the, 
the uh, uh, resistors and, and the, um, the people who were still, you know, cheering on for Japan or that kind of thing. And so I, I used to hear stories about how, um, like the kids of these families would not be uh, um, allowed into social clubs or athletic activities and stuff, and you know, so really? it, it, yeah. There's a wonderful novel by Ken Mochizuki called Beacon Hell Boys, and though it takes place in 1971, um, actually it would be 1972, but it, it moved it back a year, it still shows those kinds of divisions that his parents are insistent that he not ask about the war years, that he not act too Japanesey that he uh, associate with others, and they're all embarrassed when, uh, if anybody mentions anything about camp. Uh, and and there are all these divisions still in the community. And there was a, a, a movie made called The Beacon Hill Boys. Right, it's based that, on the right? novel. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to see that again. Yeah. Anyway, I, I think, you know, I, myself being the child of a family that had decided to go back to Japan rather than stay in the U.S. I, I did not witness or experience this kind of clash back in Southern California. So, you know. It could be a unique Seattle story in that regard. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Okay, one more question. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation and your hard work and research in producing this book. I'm looking forward to reading it. And rereading, no, no, boy. Uh, what I want to say is that my strongest impression that remains from reading the book many years ago uh, is twofold. First, uh, I thought it was a, a book about uh, finding one's identity. Uh, back in those days, uh, we talked about hyphenated Americans, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, whatever. Uh, I, I thought that that was uh, part of the heart of the, the novel. And the other point that I saw was uh, what you refer to the trauma within the community. And it's very clear in the family, the collapse of the family, what happened to the mother, and especially Ichiro's treatment of his father. His father, I mean, when I visited Japan, uh, my Japanese friends told me that after the war, uh, the strong father system collapsed, and people no longer uh, paid how do you say, um, attention to the father yeah. and what he was saying. Yeah. And the same thing happened in the United States to the Japanese American community. At least, that's my reading of the novel. Well, you do talk about camp and the family, that's all, and kind of the family breakdowns. Well, you just, came here to talk to you. Uh, yes, it's a novel about identity. And, and, and of course, in the, in the camps, it was the, the families broke down much earlier inside the camps uh, when uh, the father was no longer the breadwinner, right, and everyone was, was you know, humiliated at the same level. You had your sensei from Buddhist church, you know, at the latrine with you as a you know, kid. And that was a shock to a lot of kids see their teachers there, you know, uh, reduced to the same level as them. And then the family uh, social dinner time was broken up by the mess halls. So where, where everyone, where kids would run off with their friends, and these say friends, to the mess halls and leave the parents behind. And uh, that, 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 that's where the breakdown of the family, the respect for the father began. And uh, in, in, in Nono Boy, there's a very curious scene in the middle that kind of outside the story where the, in, 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 there's a flashback, crazy flashback, where the Nisei, Ichiro's parents are being lectured to by a Nisei sociologist about not understanding their children, right? And then uh, they, they walk by, uh, Another mess hall, a barrack, where there's a, a, a dance, and you say dance going on, and they look in through the open door, and they see their children, you know, dancing, American dances, listening to Benny, Benny Goodman music, and, and not, you know, not knowing them at all, this culture, this music, and wondering, you know, how can I relate to my children? Who, who are they? And what am I missing by not trying to understand them better? It's a very strange little scene. Since it's in the novel. Look for it. Okay. Um, I have one last question to ask each of you in kind of uh, quick response so we can have time for refreshments and uh, rest. 
I'd like to ask you, of the five short stories, which one was your favorite and why? Hmm. Well, yeah. okay, uh, yeah. they, they are exercises and, and they are young, okay, so I mean, understand that. But he did choose to publish them in the Northwest Times, so they're, they're not, they, they, he put them out there for uh, review. The, the most interesting has to be What Can I Do, which is the only story of the five that has a Japanese American protagonist named Jiro, uh, who is a hobo who walks with a limp, you know, prefiguring Kenji's uh, one legged status. And uh, who has no much hobo, and it's not said that he's a hobo because he was in camp and lost everything, came back after the war, and is looking for a meal in a cafe, and and it goes from there. It's it's, it's a it's a anecdote. It's just a snapshot. It's not a real complete short story, really. Uh, but it, it, it's interesting in that it does prefigure the two characters that he'll later develop in, in the novel. I like skipping movies. Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't pretend to be a great judge of literature, yeah. um, but it's the influences that are most interesting. And I, I like uh, the sort of foil plot, the O. Henry kind of uh, story, and uh, the irony, which prefigures the kind of devastating irony that you'll see in the novel. And of course, uh, when you do the book, Skipping Millions takes place in an army surplus store where the main character is a clerk who who helps a customer who's looking for a pen knife or something. Uh, and this is drawn from Okada's own experience uh, running a war surplus store for his friend in Seattle after the war. Well, my favorite. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, my my favorite was, um, I can't remember the title, but it's um, where he is, uh, the, the protagonist is working in uh, occupied Japan and uh, the, he's working for the, the military. Yeah, what, what can I do? Uh, what, what can I do? I'm sorry, no, no. What is it called? Uh, when, in, when in Japan. When in that's Japan. That's the play. Right. The play, the one I play. Right, that's oh, right. That's right, yeah. When in Japan. Oh, yes. that, if, you, if you count the play among the shows, that's oh, my yeah. favorite. Okay, yeah. right. And the reason I like that one uh, is because it, uh, in the irony and the uh, absurdity uh, is his anger. I feel like he is oh. so angry the way he characterizes uh, the white American officers and the way that they're treating uh, the representatives of occupied Japan. Um, that one I, I like. I, I, was, I was saying to Frank today that I loved Edward Albee, the playwright, who said, I have no sense of humor. I have a fine sense for the ridiculous, <laughs> but no sense of humor. And I think sometimes of Okada as somebody who has both perhaps. Yeah, in, in the novel, he, he, there's uh, the piercing observations of the ridiculousness of the situation right. comes through a, a lot. And I wonder also that the captain in that one I play, you know, Okada was a translator for uh, a general uh, in the uh, strategic bombing survey. Right. And they would interview the survivors of, of not just Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but of the Tokyo uh, bombings uh, for the, the effects on, you know, the effects on the civilian population of bombing. Well, it was terrible. <laughs> what can I say? But I mean, that, I, I wonder if how much of that was drawn from his observations of this in general that you can't be worked for. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to have a book signing. The authors will be over there to sign. We will not sign copies of No No Boy, though. <laughs> and there are refreshments, so please.